Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our IP Matters web series. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to introduce Michael Lin, who is going to speak about uh, patent enforcement in China. Uh, Michael earned his uh, bachelor's from UC Berkeley in uh, biochemistry and later on uh, his JD from Boston University. He spent about 13 years uh, at uh, PNG and after that uh, moved to Hong Kong to work for Marks and uh, Clerk. So with that, uh, Michael, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Pedro and uh, Patexia, for allowing me to do this, video, this webinar. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Um, given the short time that we have for this, I think we should just jump right into the uh, presentation. So we'll uh, ask Pedro to get the oh, yeah, excellent get the uh, the thing on the screen. Um, this is again patent enforcement in China. It's such a quick 20-minute webinar that um, you know we will have a chance for questions at the end. Uh, however, um, I'm just going to basically just run through this. I mean, this is something which I usually give as a half-day seminar, so we're compressing it all into 20 minutes. So um, nonetheless, let's, let's just get going. So uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick introduction of me. Um, as Pedro mentioned, I am a, uh, uh, went to Berkeley as an undergraduate for biochemistry, uh, realized I was a really, really terrible scientist. And so decided not to get a PhD in genetics. Uh, ended up moving to Boston University Law School to get a patent, uh, to get a law degree so I can do patent law. Uh, passed the Ohio bar and the USPTO bar. I am not a member of the Chinese bar, so anything in here should not be taken as legal advice. Um, in the end, you would still need to go and uh, get an opinion from a Chinese attorney about anything that you know, any issues you have. However, this is just to give some general introduction to uh, Chinese patent enforcement to people who may not be familiar with it. Um, basically, I worked as a PNG patent attorney for 13 and a half years. Uh, the last three and a half of those years was to set up the patent group in Beijing uh, for Procter and Gamble, and then I've been with Marks and Clark for two and a half years. So next slide, please. Uh, basically, China law is based on Roman law, it's civil law. So it's a very, very detailed law that they uh, publish. They try to take into all the most in, take into account all the most likely scenarios, and then give relatively uh, broad range uh, advice to the judges on what to do in those scenarios. Um, precedents are non-binding in civil law. It's not like American common law or British common law. Uh, just because a higher court has said something in a similar case does not mean that a lower court actually has to pay any attention to it whatsoever. The only thing that the courts can do which is binding on all the courts is that the Supreme People's Court in China can issue what they call a Supreme Court interpretation. And that is where the Supreme Court will say, in these types of circumstances, we believe that the judges should interpret the law in this way. Um, but everything else that the Supreme Court says is not actually binding on the lower courts. It's a very, very strange system when you come from the common law background like in the U.S. And so um, oftentimes people will ask, well, so what do the court's cases say in situations like this? Or, you know, what will, ha what will happen or what are the precedents in this type of situation or this type of uh, lawsuit in China? Unfortunately, the answer is, well, we can tell you what the law, what those previous cases have said, but they don't matter. It's very, very odd. Um, another thing that's uh, different from the Chinese law versus the American common law is that you only get one guaranteed appeal, um, and after that, it's at the discretion of the higher courts. Kind of like a, a petition of certiorari in the U.S. The Supreme People's Court could take the appeal if they feel like it, but they don't have to at all. Um, and the other thing is that it's not just a review of the specific issue of law. Um, the courts can decide to just review the previous judgment based on the facts, or they could actually uh, decide to review the entire case. It's up to the court in the appeal on how they want to review it and what they want to say about it. Things that make it really, really frustrating for uh, foreign attorneys also is that there's no federal rules of evidence in China. So what happens is that 
each court is free to decide what they want to allow as evidence in their court. Um, a lot of courts, they will not take any oral hearings. They will not take any oral arguments from the attorneys at all. Um, other ones will and look at that in conjunction with documentary evidence that's submitted. Um, oftentimes the judges may change from case to case on what they're going to allow. Sometimes they require everything to be notarized. Um, other times they may require it to be completely legalized. Other times they may not require any signing or notarization at all. Um, one of the biggest things that's also a huge change uh, in most jurisdictions outside the U.S. is that you just don't have juries in China. It's all done in front of the, the judge. Um, so, you know, entire areas of uh, U.S. practice which focus on jury selection and things like that completely irrelevant. Um, the other thing which is important in China is that, you know, not only do you have no juries, but the judges, because there's no precedential value in a lot of these other cases, you get very, very inconsistent rulings. You get a lot of local favoritism and political meddling in certain cases. Um, usually those issues can be fixed upon appeal, but again, since you only have one guaranteed appeal, you're really taking your chances. Um, you're going to have much better luck in uh, ch Chinese uh, in, in, in Chinese jurisdictions that have a lot of litigation. Uh, you're talking basically Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, those really, really big cities. Because there's so many cases going through that you get a lot more consistency because the judges all will talk to each other. They all will know who, who's talking about what types of cases. Um, and they don't want, you know, basically these cases like that, um, you know, the judges in those big cities are under such scrutiny that there's much less chance of favoritism and political meddling in those types of cases um, rather than in a small court in a city, you know, two and a half hours away from Shanghai. Okay. Um, the, another thing which is, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Another thing that which is interesting about Chinese law is that there's no discovery. So litigation in China, even including translations and everything into English, is not that expensive simply because you don't have $1 million worth of discovery or Seven hundred thousand dollars worth of discovery cost to pay. Okay, uh, go on. Next, next slide, please. Um, aside from the legal enforcement, um, which everyone has probably heard of, um, I'm going to talk about the other ways to enforce patents in China. And one of these ways are what they call administrative enforcement in the local patent office. So um, every uh, city, every large municipality, um, every large uh, state in the country of China has their own local patent offices at the state, regional, as well as the national level. Um, the ones at the local level are relatively independent, but they do have certain nationalized rules uh, on patent enforcement, on what they're allowed to do, which are uh, is a big advantage over the courts, because the courts don't have such national rules, uh, administrative rules, and things like that. Um, the problem with the local patent office is that they just don't have that much experience handling patent matter. Um, if you look at the local AICs, which are in charge of trademark enforcement, they have a huge amount of experience dealing with counter anti-counterfeiting investigations, um, you know, chasing down counterfeiters, and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, patent litigation in China is just simply not that prevalent. Uh, patent matters are now coming to the forefront, but they don't have nearly as much history and as much experience as trademark matters, uh, as people have trademark matters. So there just simply isn't that much um, going on in the local patent offices. However, they are able to run investigations. They are able to do seizures of you know, patent infringing materials, uh, machines, or whatever, they are able to impose local fines as well as administrative punishments. Now, fines are real, something that has been around for a little bit, but not actually, um, haven't actually been enforced so much. Um, recently, the past year or so, there's been a lot more uh, emphasis on fines. There's something which is officially approved now, so uh, you are seeing requests for fines in certain uh, 
actions that are taken by local patent offices. However, they're not very common yet. Um, administrative punishments have received a lot of news recently. Um, they can include anything from um, uh, you know, actual re revocation of the business license of the company to uh, paying uh, local fines or something like that, which um, you know could include even uh, things like a suggestion to the local prosecutor to investigate uh, at a criminal level uh, the, the, the patent um, infringement that's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, customs enforcement is also something which I think is relatively uh, underused by foreign companies. Um, basically, you can take your IP, regardless of the IP, whether it be copyright, trademark, or patents, and register them in the National Customs Office. Now, that in and of itself, for, especially for a patent matter, is not going to be a, very helpful for you. However, what you do is you then go and visit the customs agents. Say if you know that infringing articles are being shipped out of Shanghai, right? Go visit the Shanghai customs agents and actually have educate them on here's what the infringing item is, here's how you can tell an infringing item versus you know the legitimate item. Here are the companies that we believe are shipping out these infringing items, here's the manufacturer, you know, any information you have on these infringing items which can help the customs office A, identify them, and then B, understand which ones are infringing and which ones are legitimate, are we not infringing, uh, will help them. Um, and we've had some relatively good success when I was at PG uh, educating customs on identifying the differences between infringing and non-infringing items. Um, again, it's more difficult, much more difficult on the patent side than the trademark side. But you know, if you give them enough information, they are willing to go and and, and look for this. But they're much more reactive rather than proactive uh, on the patent side. On the trademark side, the customs agents are much more uh, proactive. Um, the thing about the, the customs enforcement in the administrative side is that you also have to be aware that. Um, if you, if the customs agents call you up and say, "Look, we've identified this shipment. It's this, you know, 40-foot container um, that's heading to Los Angeles," uh, they will ask you, "Do you want us to hold this container?" If you say yes, then you have to answer within a very short period of time, three days or so. If you say yes, we want you to hold the container, you have to put up a bond which will you know, go to the uh, container owner in the case that this turns out to be a bogus claim. Right? So you need, to be, you need to have a local agent who's ready you know, with the money to put up a bond. Um, if within the period of the investigation they find out that yes, this really is something which is an infringing item, then you're going to have to follow up with, with, with it in court. Um, and that, again, comes on a very, very strict deadline, one week or two weeks, depending on the local office, um, where you have only a certain amount of time to then follow up and file a lawsuit in court, in the local court, to uh, uh, charge the infringer uh, with infringement. The good thing is that because this evidence has now been seized by the government entity, which is the customs office, the evidentiary proceedings are much easier. This evidence will definitely be able to get admitted into the local Chinese court. Um, you don't have, need to have it notarized and things like that because it's all handled by the government. You actually never get to touch the stuff until it actually goes to the court. So the, those evidence issues are much better handled and much easier, much more easily handled in this type of situation. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, arbitration in China, this is something which <clears throat> um, has had quite a bit of uh, uh, debate recently, I would say. Um, basically, arbitration in China is a viable option. Um, you can get international arbitration awards enforced in China probably more easily than you can get foreign uh, legal awards enforced in China. 
Um, however, uh, most of the time you will end up having to arbitrate within China itself. In your contracts, you should definitely describe where you're going to arbitrate under what rules, um, international arbitration rules or some other form of the rules, what language is going to be the major language for the arbitration. Um, all these typical details which are in an arbitration clause. In other countries, you should have these arbitration clauses in China, in the Chinese contracts as well. Um, there is one officially recognized arbitration association in China, and you see that there at CTAC. Um, that has uh, had an interesting history in the past, say, 12, 13, 14 months. Basically, in uh, 2011 to 2012, there was uh, a series of proclamations made by the Beijing CTAC office, which then led to the Shenzhen and Shanghai offices of CTAC being disavowed by Beijing. It's kind of like a, you know, uh, in Mission Impossible where the government disavows the MI group. They ref basically, Beijing has refused to acknowledge that the Shenzhen and the Shanghai offices are actual CTAC offices because uh, the Shenzhen and Shanghai offices refused to accept the new rules that were uh, promulgated by Beijing in, uh, early, I think it was maybe beginning of 2012, um, but there had already been rumblings of this since 2011. Um, and so uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai for quite a long time kept on assuring people that they were CTEC offices while Beijing was saying they are not. Recently, uh, just a week or two weeks ago, a court in China refused to enforce the Shanghai CTEC arbitration award because they said that the Shanghai CTAC is no longer an official uh, arbitration entity in China. So because of that, uh, the, the advice to foreign entities and foreign clients right now is simply designate the Beijing branch. Um, a lot of people used to use designate Shanghai CTAC or Shenzhen CTAC because they were viewed as more business friendly, less bureaucratic. Um, right now, if you're drafting a contract or an arbitration clause for China, it doesn't make the big branch. Because otherwise, you don't know what's going to happen in the next six to eight months or ten years uh, when you actually try to enforce this thing. Um, that is uh, something which, until these new um, CTAC rules are, are really settled and the dispute between Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Beijing is settled, um, that's going to be the standard advice because the Beijing branch will, since they are the first official branch um, and the, the most political of all the branches, they will always be okay. But right now, Shenzhen and Shanghai, I mean, Sh Shenzhen already changed their name to something else. Uh, Shanghai, every week you're hearing new um, uh, news about the Shanghai branch and, and their fight with the Beijing branch. It's very interesting to see uh, from a political point of view that this fight, which is typically very laundry that's not aired publicly, um, this this dispute has actually become very, very public with um, the different offices issuing proclamations against each other. It's very, very funny. So, but right now, if you have any arbitration issues, um, go ahead and, you know, arbitration, again, it is viable in China. Um, you can oftentimes get better and more predictable results in arbitration than you can in litigation. So I'd say go ahead and use arbitration in China, but be sure to designate the Beijing CTAC branch for the arbitration. Okay, um, that is right exactly 20 minutes. So, um, any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Michael. That was very interesting. Uh, just one quick question. We don't have that much time. Uh, we have seen in recent years uh, there's been uh, more filing activity by Chinese uh, companies in the U.S. Has there been anything uh, similar happening in China, like uh, any U.S., major U.S. companies filing a lot in China? Um, I would say that over the past 15 years or so, there has been a continued increase in uh, Western companies' filings in China. Um, it's just a constant increase, you know, up 10, 15 percent each year, uh, specifically for foreign companies. So. It's, there hasn't been anything that's really changed so much. I mean, there was a big dip in 2008, 2009 uh, because of the worldwide economy, but that pretty much uh, was
was a smaller dip in China filings than it was in the U.S. filings. Um, you still see multinationals filing in China on a regular basis. Um, you see smaller companies, SMEs, in ch starting to file in China as well, which is something that's relatively new, but the numbers there are not huge yet. Um, it just depends on the SME, it depends on the industry. Um, you know, electronic industry, uh, computer industry, wireless industry, communications industry, obviously because of the patent pools, they're all filing in China. But uh, in other industries, it just really depends. It's kind of splotchy, you know. I see. One more question. Uh, has there been any initiatives by Chinese government to educate the public generally about intellectual property in recent years? Yeah, there's years? been a huge push in that. Um, it's been in both of the most recent five-year plans, so it's something that's been going on for a while. Uh, they focused mostly on copyright and trademark, uh, say, seven to two years ago. Uh, nowadays, they're probably more, or they're focusing more on patent. So educating the public about patents, utility models, things like that, design patents. There's also um, a huge push by the Chinese government to, I would say, move up the, the food chains and not just become a manufacturing powerhouse, but actually to become a design and R&D powerhouse as well. And so part of that is strengthening intellectual property protection as well as the um, getting you know, normal Chinese people to understand IP protection and IP laws better. So there is a huge amount of um, education going on. It's slow. It's a, it's a culture change. All culture changes take a lot of time, so it's slow, but it's, you know, it's going to get there eventually. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, just for uh, the attendees, I, the slides and the presentation are going to be available after the talk. And our next, next talk is going to be Patent Strategies for Startups by Lang McCarty, CEO of uh, Vested IP. It's going to be on August 8th. We look forward to see you all next month. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.